Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I'm Bill Keegan. I'm curator of Caribbean archaeology at the Florida Museum of Natural History. I want to thank, thank Phil for uh, inviting me to give this talk and mention that his timing is impeccable. Um, my retirement takes effect next June 30th, and many of my final projects involve Jamaica. First, last year I learned that the Florida Museum had the remains of at least five individuals from a site at Rio Nuevo, and we are in the process of preparing these for return to Jamaica. Second, because Leslie Gail Atkinson was using the data from Paradise Park in her PhD dissertation, I held off preparing the final, final, final report, although all the field and lab notes were sent to the JNHT. Now that uh, Leslie Gale is Dr. Atkinson, I am working on a more comprehensive report on the work that we did there. You'll hear some of that today. And last, my final issue of the Journal of Caribbean Archaeology is uh, devoted to a collection of articles on Jamaica, and Leslie Gale is editing that. So still lots of things to do, but um, looking forward to um, sitting back and watching the next generation take charge. Paradise Park is located on the southwest coast on Bluefields Bay between Savannah Lamar and Ferris Cross. And the image on the right, it's that box um, right above where it says Paradise Park. I'm gonna apologize in advance for some of my images. The um, technology was not up as, uh, as good 20 years ago as it is today. And so some of the things, some of my photographs and slides haven't withstood the test of time. The drawing at the top shows Paradise Park and some of the environments um, within the park. And uh, the bottom left is a um, aerial photograph of the park. Um, you can see Bluff Point sticking out and then Bluff Point also on the map above it. Paradise Park was a dairy farm when we worked there, but in the 1970s, it was a tourist destination with bull riding and golf course. During an environmental survey of the property, a number of pre-Columbian potsherds were found on the surface. The late Tony Clark, managing partner, contacted the JNHT. Roderick Ebanks then visited the area, excavated five test units, and prepared a very comprehensive report on his work. Unfortunately, his responsibilities as director of archaeology for the JNHT prevented him from doing more. Tony called me in 1998. If you had ever met Tony, you'd know that he, doesn't, he didn't take no for an answer. I was working in the Turks and Caicos at the time, and he'd gotten my name from Marsha Pardee, who was arranging to ship feral donkeys from Grand Turk to greener pastures. Six of them were there to greet me when I arrived in Paradise Park. I used to joke with Tony that I'd worked with a lot of donkeys over the years, but these were the first to get me a job. I owe a great debt to Tony and his son, Eric, also known as Busha, for their unwavering support. The project would not have been possible had they not opened their farm to us and provided logistical and moral support. In addition, we could not have accomplished as much as we did without teams of Earthwatch volunteers and especially our collaboration with JNHT archeologists. And uh, the folks from JNHT showed up every day and worked diligently despite the frequent appearance of Bush's large Rottweiler. And that's Tony on the right, and I have no idea who that young kid on the left is. Paradise Park is on a low-lying coastal plain with the deeply weathered Chibuktu Karst Hills to the east. The seaward margin is a series of arcuate, sub-parallel, former beach ridges aligned to the present shore. The coastal zone presently is prograding, as indicated by mapping undertaken in 1971 and again in 1991. In fact, the first dune along the shore apparently formed in the past 500 years. Shovel tests and walkover surveys failed to reveal any evidence of indigenous activities, which only occurred on the second dune along the old road where Roderick had conducted his research. There is a fringe of red mangroves along the coast. The soils are alluvial and mangrove swamp loams and clays with medium to coarse, moderately sorted carbonate sand of marine origin. Burrowing land crabs are active in the area. In fact, the archeological sites were found because crabs had moved artifacts to the ground surface. The sites are located in an undeveloped area near the Sweetwater River along the old road that connected Sav and Cave Settlement. And the road isn't apparent here, but the two 
blue stars indicate the approximate location of the two sites. We started in 1998 by excavating 50 centimeter square diameter shovel tests at 20 meter intervals along the old road for a distance of 1.5 kilometers. Philip Allsworth Jones brought a group of students from UE to watch, and there's a couple of them in this picture helping, um, along with Peter Harris, who came down for part of the project. Um, sorry, I don't have a picture of Philip, but uh, um, when he saw his after picture, he made me burn it. But instead of watching, I put them all to work. Philip got to work with my long-term partner, Betsy Carlson. And at the end of a long day digging test pits, all he could say was, that Betsy is a machine. The most interesting artifact from the shovel tests was this pottery foot. And we didn't find anything else that looked anything like it in um, all of the excavations that we conducted. The shovel tests indicated that there were actually two archeological sites along the old road. The two sites are situated, as I said, on the second dune from the coast with freshwater morass or swamp to the north and south. Um, but when the sites were occupied, we were probably directly on the shore. The dune is quite narrow, averaging only about 60 meters in width, and it's only one to one and a half meters above mean sea level. The vegetation is natural sea level coastal tropical forest and is dominated by large trees. We returned to these sites over the next four years for a total of 17 weeks of field work. Working there was something of a Disney-esque adventure. The first year, we loaded onto a cattle cart and then upgraded to the Jitney in this picture for the trip from the Great House where we lived across the river and onto the site. And um, I will say that the Great House itself was a bit of an archeological feature. Um, the roof leaked, the floors were warped, um, and it hadn't been put to much use since the clubhouse closed um, more than 20 years earlier. The first site called Sweetwater begins 900 meters west of the Sweetwater River and extends for about 220 meters. All of the pottery is either plain or has Montego Bay style motifs, which fit within Rouse's Mayakoid series. The site is on slightly higher ground, supporting mostly tropical hardwoods, including an eight foot tall Saba tree, which you can see on the left. A total of 82 square meters were excavated, primarily in two large block excavations of 41 and 35 square meters each. The deposits ranged in depth from 20 centimeters to a meter, and the site was radiocarbon dated to AD 1430 but was occupied into historic times as indicated by old world rat bones, ratus ratus, encountered to depths of 70 centimeters in the site. The site contains pottery in a single style, a few shell ornaments, flake chert, a greenstone or jadeite wedge, and a conch shell stelt. Animal remains included small fish, birds, and a few hutias. Mollusks were incredibly abundant. There are far more clamshells in the site than at the other, and many of them showed evidence for use as scrapers. I'll come back to this. Use of shells for scrapers may reflect a change in food processing over time and between the two sites. And those of you who know Jamaican archeology, span if you can see my pointer sort of on the right center is the then director of archeology, span Roderick Ebank. So even Roderick didn't get a pass when he came out to the field. After a 240 meter gap with no cultural materials, we encountered the second site called Paradise. The Paradise site is in a swamp, swampy grove of royal palms. It was occupied during a period of lower sea level as indicated by deposits below the water table. This is a redware site with materials distributed along our transcript, transect for 400 meters and dated to AD 850. A total of 29 square, Oops, sorry. A total of 29 square meters were excavated in two block excavations. Area 300 was on the back slope of the southern side of the dune, and area 400 pictured here is 100 meters to the east and about 20 meters higher up on the dune. The site contained pottery of a single style, mollusk shells, especially conch shells and olive shells, some of which were cut into beads and tinklers, and chert or flint flakes, were common in the site. The most spectacular finds were an agate ear spool and a dog god pendant. 
And in this picture, you can see the, uh, the very red um, redware. The upper right is our dog god pendant. Um, it's the, the bound figure. Um, bottom left, I'm sorry for the blurry photo, but you can see that there's an abundance of conch shells, sea turtle bones, and other materials within the excavation units that my volunteers, Ralph and Mary Lou Pax are working on. The faunal remains at the site were predominantly sea turtles and fish. There's no obvious evidence of cultural mixing at either site. The implication being that the Paradise site was abandoned before the Sweetwater site was occupied. The only feature at either site was a possible post stain at the Paradise site, but efforts to find associated stains were unsuccessful. Given the swampy conditions, it is possible that houses were built on stilts like at the Los Buchelones site in Cuba, something to keep in mind. And given the narrow width of the dune, multiple houses would have, would have had to have been aligned along the dune, as is the case in the Bahamas along the coast, in contrast to more circular oval or grid plan, settle, grid plan settlements observed elsewhere in the Caribbean. The two sites provided an opportunity to examine cultural change as first indicated by differences in pottery styles in a shared environment. Scientific comparisons typically are conducted under the assumption of all else being equal. For example, environmental differences are often used to explain cultural differences. It's one of the reasons we don't hunt polar bears in Jamaica. Of course, we probably shouldn't hunt polar bears anyway. At Paradise Park, I could argue that the environment was essentially the same, or at least offered no substantial differences. If the two sites contained different materials, then it was people who were responsible. Comparing the two sites, I should first note that both had large numbers of Pleurodonta land snails, both alive and dead. I'm undecided as to whether these were collected and eaten, but we did our harvest and eat a few. They were essentially tasteless, but at only four grams of meat, it would take a lot of them to make even an appetizer. There were substantial numbers of flint and chert flakes at both sites. It looked to me like there were differences in the flakes being produced at each site. Uh, the Paradise site seemed to, they seemed to have selected a more yellow looking chert. Um, the flakes were larger in size, Sweetwater, site had a, a darker colored shirt um, and uh, many more smaller flakes and micro flakes. Um, all of the flint seems to have come from the Sweetwater River or at least upstream in, in the Sweetwater River. Not being an expert, I engaged a student who specialized in lithics to compare them. Unfortunately, he, as I say, flaked out. More recently, I got Reniel Rodriguez Ramos, Ramos interested in studying the collection. Reniel is the expert on lithic tools in the Caribbean and has documented significant differences in the lithics used at Archaic Age, Saladoid, and Wakeoid sites in Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, by the time he had time, COVID-19 brought everything to a halt. There are also significant differences in the animal remains at the site, sites. The earlier Paradise site contains lots of sea turtle bones, but these are virtually absent from the Sweetwater site. Such extirpation of sea turtles also was observed at early sites in the Bahamas and elsewhere in the Caribbean. As the largest single package of meat, and given their vulnerability during nesting, it is not surprising that sea turtles were targeted by the earliest inhabitants of the area. Excavations in areas with clay soils necessitated the use of water screening. Um, and if any of my Jamaican colleagues are here, that is uh, Audine Brooks on the left and Ricardo Tyndale helping uh, Michael Monez um, in the screens. Water screening was especially important for recovering small fish bones, lithic microflakes, and beads. Bulk voucher samples were collected from each of the excavation units. Our main effort in the lab involved cleaning, sorting, and weighing of mollusk shells. And here you can see the, my JNHT colleagues helping me in the afternoon in the lab. The mollusks and echinoderms told an interesting story. 
A total of almost 4,000 shells were identified in the Paradise site. Conch shell was abundant, as were clams, but predominantly in the Cardiidid family, I think cockles. Cardiids prefer free circulating seawater and cannot feed where there is a high sediment load. In contrast, the more than 10,000 shells at the Sweetwater site were mostly clams that thrive in silty waters, especially those in the Lucinidae family along with mud conchs in the Melanginidae family. And there were far fewer queen conchs or other, conch, uh, other strombidae shells at Sweetwater. We interpreted this shift as a product of increasing siltation of Bluefields Bay. This likely resulted from the increase in land clearance over time, resulting in increased sediment loads in the Sweetwater and Deans Valley rivers. This process has continued as evidenced by a new dune in front of the dune on which the archeological sites are located, a prograding shoreline recorded between surveys conducted in 1971 and 1991, poor visibility in Bluefields Bay and a dying coral reef. Although many earlier projects documented environmental degradation on land, this was one of the first to show that pre-Columbian peoples had significant impacts on large scale marine environments. And the, the bottom left, you can see some of the clams from the excavation. Um, these are uh, Kodakia as well as Lucina pectinata. And um, it's a, um, a small sample, but there's a whole variety of ways that these shells were broken for use as scrapers. So there were um, a whole variety of, of uses to which the shells were put. Finally, there's a small flooded sinkhole across the main road near the entrance to the property. Given the then discoveries at La Leyte in the Dominican Republic and at Blue Holes in the Bahamas, David Fenley, Joe McKnight, and I made an exploratory scuba dive. The shallow sinkhole has deep, silty sediments that reduce visibility to zero in a matter of seconds, and nothing was found during our exploration. So that, in a nutshell, is the Paradise Park story. But before I finish, I want to briefly place these sites in their wider Jamaican and Caribbean context. You may have noticed <coughs> excuse me, that I use the Jamaican pottery style names. I prefer Redware or Little River and White Marl, Montego Bay, Morant Bay to Rouse's, Osteonan, and Mayakan subseries. I found that some investigators use the broader terms to conclude they know more than they actually do about indigenous history. In other words, we think that Osteonan in Puerto Rico is the same as Osteonan in Jamaica, when all we really know is that they made similar kinds of pottery. Going forward, we need a greater focus on local styles and local assemblages to advance our understanding of cultural diversity throughout the Caribbean. When I first came to Jamaica to do archeology, span uh, my first trip actually was in 1973 when I went scuba diving in Montego Bay. Um, one of the issues concerned the transition from redware to white marl. The only reason this was an issue is because Rouse's culture history posited a transition from osteonoid to maicoid. He later subsumed both pottery series as subseries of osteonoid to reaffirm his belief in a singular line of development. Thus, osteonin begat maicoid. If a smooth transition in decorative styles did occur, and I'm not convinced it did without substantial influence from peoples living in Western and Central Venezuela. Then it occurred about AD 500 to 600 in the Sabao Valley of Central Hispaniola. We should not expect to observe this transition in Jamaica. After all, what are the chances that Asionan was transformed into Mayacan in exactly the same ways independently in Hispaniola and Jamaica? The question we should be asking is why did redware suddenly disappear in Jamaica? And if you look at these, these are sort of just general pottery motifs associated with osteonoid and maicoid. Um, osteonoid tends to be a, a very smooth surface, red painting, it has lugs and, um, and projections. Um, in contrast, the maicoid is usually fired in a, um, a less oxidizing environment. Um, zone and size crosshatch incisions, applique like the crosshatch applique punctations. Um, various kinds of applique like the, um, uh, the sigmoid shape on the um, right-hand side with the, um, the cross-cutting um, cross incisions. Um, very different styles of pottery and um, difficult to um, um, 
except on my part at least, that these one evolved into the other. My explanation for the historical sequence is that osteonoid, broadly speaking, reflects the increased use of pottery by archaic age peoples. Pottery was made by archaic age peoples in Cuba in small quantities for 2000 years before the advent of the ceramic age. The advantage that pottery offered was the more efficient preparation of heated liquids. Two types of comestibles probably obtained first through exchange with the newly arrived ceramic age peoples of Puerto Rico and Eastern Hispaniola, likely encouraged them to uh, archaics and others to make greater use of pottery vessels. One is the preparation of maize as porridge, which has provided a, to, proved to be an amazing weaning food that has substantially reduced infant mortality around the world. The other is the preparation of alcoholic beverages from maize and manioc. If these were previously unknown, I would expect their rapid adoption and a concomitant increase in the use of pots. Whether or not the increasing use of pottery represents the next stage of archaic development or the next wave of ceramic age expansion from the East is not that important. What is important is that Asianoid peoples were the equivalent of frontier folk, the first wave of expansion into the previously unoccupied islands of Jamaica and the Bahamas. They settled along the coast and exploited a pristine fauna, including sea turtles, iguanas, bush and ground nesting birds, and untouched fisheries. They lived in small groups, and when the best resources in the area were depleted, they moved on to the next virgin territory. The Paradise site fits this scenario. Its 400 meter length probably does not reflect a single occupation, but multiple episodes of abandonment and reoccupation. We see exactly the same pattern in the Bahamas. The Red Ware peoples were followed within a few centuries by a new wave of immigrants, probably from Hispaniola. This Mayakoid migration was affected by larger, more sedentary farming communities. Marcio Veloz Maggiolo notes at least an initial preference for mangrove habitats like the one at Paradise Park. However, over time, Mayakoid settlements were increasingly located on hilltops above the coastal plains of Hispaniola, Cuba, and Jamaica. The sites in the hills above Kingston are an excellent example. Where Hutia dominate the faunal assemblage at the sites near Kingston, the Sweetwater site reflects an emphasis on marine resources. Because the site was occupied until after the arrival of European rats, we see a long-standing complementary settlement pattern in which some communities were located to take advantage of agricultural land and defensive positions, while others produced marine foods for exchange. And living in a swamp by itself provides its own defensive advantages. And this is a pattern that we also see in uh, north coastal Cuba. I mentioned defense because tribal societies around the world are often in a near constant state of warfare. But think of this like you would think of the Republicans and Democrats in the United States. It's not the type of conquest warfare that was practiced by modern states. All right, I'm gonna move briefly into human biology and um, I'm offering a trigger warning if anyone objects or is, um, is upset by seeing images that include um, humans then please uh, turn off your screen or look away for the next slide. And then I'll, I'll let you know when the following slide is up. In a study of indigenous facial morphology, my colleagues and I recognized that individuals from Jamaica, Hispaniola and the Bahamas formed a single cluster that differed from both Puerto Rico, um, ceramic age Puerto Rico and archaic age Cuba. We noted that the one thing all three had in common was Mayakoid pottery. And we suggested a migration to Hispaniola by Caribs from Western South America beginning about AD 500. As I showed earlier, <clears throat> Mayakoid pottery is significantly different from Ostinoid pottery. And it suddenly appeared in Hispaniola with this distinct set of motifs executed as parallel line incisions, applique, punctations, and built adornos. It closely resembles pottery associated with the South American Caribs and its appearance in Hispaniola occurred at the same time the Caribs were expanding their territory in, South, uh, in um, South America. Facial morphology has an underlying genetic component, so these differences merit further study. And if you look at the skull, you can see numbers which indicate the different measurements that were taken to characterize um, the facial features. 
And this is a simple dendrogram. Um, everything's connected because that's what the statistical package will produce. Florida and Panama were outliers that weren't um, really related to the others, but Cuba and the Yucatan um, produced very similar results. Bahamas, Hispaniola, and Jamaica produced very similar results. And Colombia, Puerto Rico, and Venezuela produced similar results. We, uh, we had hoped that evidence would come from a recent DNA study to support this, um, but we did not receive any direct support. But as I'm gonna talk, uh, mention, there is evidence for genetic substructure and um, Alfredo Coppa, who studies dental morphology has noticed similar morphometric differences among populations in Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. <coughs> as I said, we hope that evidence would come from a recent DNA study However, the study found that all of the ceramic age peoples who colonized the islands exhibit a remarkable degree of genetic homogeneity. Um, this is um, the slide from um, Daniel and, and Kendra's um, multi co authored paper that appeared um, at the end of last year and shows some of the, the genetic substructure within the, um, the Caribbean, although everything. Is, uh, is pretty much traced in the islands to A, which is the uh, Caribbean ceramic clade. There appears to have been only one ceramic age migration from South America, and that there was no genetic evidence for our proposed Carib migration, as I mentioned. Nevertheless, there is genetic substructure within the islands. For example, the only two samples from, the Maya, from a Mayakoid site and that's here, Haiti Mayak. The Dial 1 site in Haiti show the only evidence for substantial admixture with the preceding archaic age groups. And the Bahamas and ceramic age Cuba form a subclade, as does the Southeastern Dominican Republic. We might have an older version of the image here. Both of these subclades probably result from bottlenecks in the transmission of genetic materials at their point of origin. The largest gaps in the DNA data right now are Jamaica and Haiti, and we can't hope to understand the biological relationships in the Western Caribbean without samples from these countries. Genome-wide and haplogroup data from both are essential to decipher relationships between islands. For example, although the Bahamas are characterized by a single genetic subclade, we do see mitochondrial DNA evidence for the movement of people into the Bahamas first from Hispaniola, but later in prehistory, also from Cuba. Examining individuals from red ware and white marl populations should provide evidence for where they came from, how they interacted, and why the latter replaced the former. Finally, I truly believe it's imperative for archeologists to disseminate their work to the public. We're very fortunate to have visits from the Paradise Park Preparatory School um, shown here and the Jamaica Tourist Product Development Company also sent the team out to spend the day with us, two days with us. I have learned an amazing amount from being asked questions that many people pressed us as, this is probably a stupid question, but then I couldn't answer it. My motto has always been, I was right, everything I do know is wrong. While working at Sweetwater, I noticed the director of the Tourist Product Development Corporation staring at the nearby save a tree. When I asked her what she was looking at, she said that the tree was smoking. Indeed, the crown of the tree seemed shrouded in smoke despite the clear, beautiful day. I moved closer to investigate, but could not find any explanation. It was at that moment I understood a duppy, or perhaps a Taino Opia was scrutinizing our work. Fortunately, it did not throw heat. There's much in this world that we still don't understand and so much to be learned. And I wanna thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, archeologists love to talk about their research, never hesitated to ask one of us. And I especially wanna thank everyone who contributed to this work. Um, the great archeologists of the Jamaican National Heritage Trust, the Earthwatch Institute volunteers, um, and the University of Florida and Florida Museum of Natural History who've um, supported me for 35 years now. So thank you all.